Three. Good afternoon. Welcome to our interview with exceptional leaders in Homeland Security. To honor Women's History Month, Women in Homeland Security and Homeland Security Today have partnered to introduce you to some of the women who are leading, innovating, and breaking down all the barriers in Homeland Security. My name is Kalina White from UC San Diego, and I currently work at HS Today as an assistant editor. I'm exploring the field of Homeland Security, and when our team was charged with putting together our features for Women's History Month, we decided that asking some of our emerging leaders to conduct the interviews was a way to introduce them to established leaders and provide exceptional mentoring all in the same. With that, I'm extremely proud to continue the series with Dr. Ajit Mon. Dr. Mon is an internationally recognized security and defense analysis and narrative strategist. Dr. Mon's research and her books, such as Counterterrorism Narrative Strategies, Soft Power on Hard Problems, and Narrative Warfare, focus on deconstructing dominant and coercive narratives. As founder and CEO of Narrative Strategies, Dr. Mon leads a coalition of scholars and military professionals who are working to end extremism through narrative analysis and international dialogue. In addition to her work with narrative strategies, Dr. Mon shares her research with others through her various roles in academia. She is also a pre professor of global security at Arizona State University. Welcome, Dr. Mon. It's great to be with you, Kalina. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so talk to us a little bit about your research and position as CEO and founder of Narrative Strategies. Is that the job that you wanted the, when you were younger? <laughs> no. Um, I, <laughs> I would have never guessed that I would be doing this. Um, I'm an academic, um, my doctorate is in philosophy, and I thought I would be, um, you know, probably a philosophy professor and, and write, I love to write and read, and I thought that's what I would do. Um, when I wrote my third book, um, Counterterrorism Narrative Strategies, the response that I got was surprising. Um, a lot of military professionals approached me, wanted to talk, wanted to invite me to conferences, that sort of thing. And a group of us kind of got together and, you know, formed a friendship and um, started working on very specifically countering extremist recruiting um, using narrative strategies. And it just, our group sort of just was organically created that way. I guess any one of us could have taken the lead. I happened to be the one that registered us as a business and, um, I guess I am well suited for that position, um, but I would not have predicted it. So, um, and, and our original team is still together. We've brought on other people, but we are still that original cohesive team that started Narrative Strategies years ago. That's amazing. Um, how would you define Narrative Strategies? Yeah, so the business or the um, practice, they're kind of the, a, a lot the same thing. Narrative Strategies is about the way that narrative influences people on a less than conscious level, not an unconscious level, but a not completely conscious level. And all narrative is strategic. So um, we look at you know, how narrative influences people for better or worse. And narrative strategies, the group, the think tank focuses on that. As I said, we started focusing just on extremist recruiting, but we've expanded quite a lot and we do lots of things. We even have corporate clients right now who um, want nothing to do with the military. But um, they, a lot of people from a lot of different sectors have realized, oh, this is, you know, we can use this. These kind of strategies are what we need for whatever their mission is. So our client base has really expanded and what, so what narrative strategies does now is strategic narrative and it just, it just depends on who our client is, who our clients are um, in, in terms of how we apply the strategies. That's so fascinating that they can apply to anything, <laughs> even though it started out in terrorism. Um, right. I, what would you consider were your greatest accomplishments um, in your time as narrative strategies or throughout your career? Um, I think when we started, it what people didn't realize what narrative even was. And there was a lot of convincing that had to happen. Um, people thought, okay, well, there's a place for storytelling and in communication, but we really had to say, you know, there's this storytelling and narrative are different things. Effective storytelling triggers narrative, but they're not the same thing. And so I, I think 
a, an achievement that is not fully a narrative strategies achievement, but I think we can take a lot of credit, is to get the general public and the military in the United States in, in particular to understand that narrative is important. Definitely. That's uh, so. I'm a political science major, but I'm also minoring in English literature. And so, a lot of what you talk about, um, the narratives, is something that I see reflected both in political, um, the political world, but also in the books that I'm reading and the stories that I'm reading. Um, and that's something that we talk a lot about. I'm in a pandemic fictions class right now. Um, and so, the narrative of, of the pandemic, that's like literally what we're studying right now. Um, so I totally understand the importance of it. And it's really cool to see you um, apply this to terrorism and to other clients as well. Um, what were your greatest challenges in, um, I guess maybe convincing everyone that it's important or starting your think tank? Mm -hmm. um, I think that was convincing people that it was important. Um, and now the challenge is, I think, defining narrative helping people to actually accept a definition of narrative that isn't loosey-goosey. So, so we're trying to say, you know, there's, there's the way that the people on the street use the term, but those of us in academia have spent a lot of time working this through. And so we needn't reinvent the wheel um, when we apply it to different areas. We just, if, if, you know, if we can integrate what we know across sections, um, we'd be better off. And that, I think, is the challenge at the moment. That's so interesting. Um, what qualities do you see in yourself that helped you overcome a particularly stressful time in your career? Mm. I have this thing that I say to myself when in a problematic situation and, and sort of the phrase I use inside my head is, how am I going to turn this around? And what that means to me is not just how am I going to make this better, like band-aid it, but how am I going to make this bad situation into a really good one so that in five years from now, I can look back and go, well, it's a good thing that bad thing happened because I would not have been stretched to come up with a solution. And if I hadn't been stretched, I wouldn't have done you know, what I did after that. So there have been a lot of situations that I just kind of put that in my head. How am I going to turn this around? And sometimes the answer comes at night or it comes when I'm grocery shopping or something. But I think um, looking for the silver lining in your problems is, is, um, is a positive approach and one that works for me. Awesome. Yeah, I, I always like to be more positive than negative. Um, <laughs> some of my friends are like, you know, if you accept the worst and like expect it, then when the good things happen, you'll be extra happy. And I'm like, no, I want to be happy all the time. Right, right. And what you what you focus on expands. So yeah. um, I think having a good attitude is important. Oh, for sure. It you makes so much so so much easier. Yes, precisely. Mm -hmm. Um, and what gave you the most personal satisfaction in your job or what kept you at it when times were really tough? Um, the effect, the positive effect that we have seen um, when people um, use the information we give them and it makes a difference. And so often, um, you know, right now we have a project ongoing uh, uh, focused on the anti-vax um, situation that everybody's talking about and um the thought there and we're doing some pro bono work there and, and the thought is just if we can save a life two lives three lives then it's worth our time and effort and um and we have so that's the most rewarding that's so fascinating what are you doing with the um anti-vax what are some of the things that you're well, we're working with, a, uh, with some other groups and um, we're putting together a kind of working paper. It'll be out probably in about a week. Um, so I should, probably shouldn't talk about it until it comes out, but, um, but I'll send it right over to you when, we, when it comes out. That's fascinating. Yeah, I'd love to read it. Um, who, all right, so away from, away from your, your awesome working paper, <laughs> who were some of your role models um, in your career and at Narrative Strategies? 
Oh, um, Mitzi McFate is a is a role model. Um, Judy Phillipson. Um, earlier on, I think um, I, I, you know early mentors were Dr. Catherine Cater, Beverly Blanich, um, Catherine Mulligan. Uh, Lauren Hildebrandt. There were people, you know, you know, people, women in my life who not only had unusual careers, but had unusual lives and did things that I hadn't seen people do before, much less women do before. And it's not that I necessarily wanted to emulate what they did or live the way exactly that they did, but I just thought many times in my life, well, if she can do that, I can do this. So um, in, in, in the national security world, there are a lot of women that are very supportive of one another. And, and, um, and Christina is one of them. And um, so it's, it's terrific. I mean, we do have a sisterhood and we do support each other and we do take on mentors and we, um, we mentor each other and we take on younger people and we kind of, you know, I'll take on a, mentee and then I'll suggest that she meet another of my friends in this world and and uh, we kind of look we look after the younger people and you know help young women when we can just like you're doing right now <laughs> yeah. yeah I'm happy to I'm happy to if I can if I can help in any way <laughs> Um, yeah, so it's amazing that you had so many women role models. I think that in the other interviews I've done, that not was like not necessarily the case. Um, not a judgment, but just it's great that you you had that experience. Where do you think there were any specific challenges that you faced because you're a woman, um, and how did you overcome them? Hmm. I think more in graduate school than in my career. Um, philosophy is not a field that there are a lot of women in, and so. Even joining groups like the Society for Women Philosophers, it was sort of poo hoo. You know, what do you, what do you, why do you have to get together? What are you talking about over there in that group? Um, it, it, we were encouraged to do it like men. And so, I mean, a lot of philosophy depends on who's doing the philosophizing, right? So, what, the, what your end result is depends on the assumptions you go in with. And those, a lot of those assumptions you go in with are, are subjective. Um, so what you get when you have a certain segment of the population doing a certain thing and nobody else is let in is a certain type of predictable result. And so I think the challenge was more in graduate school and it was that sort of thing. And I, I, it's been a while, but I, I trust that that has changed. Excellent. Um, that's, that's interesting to know going because I'm considering grad school right now. Um, so definitely something to consider. How did you balance such high powered positions with your personal life? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I have. <laughs> I work more than I do anything else. Um, I work 10, 11, 12 hours a day, seven days a week. And so, I mean, I think my kids would say it's not very balanced and, you know they complain about oh that vacation yeah that Maui trip was great except mom made us listen to her speech like 50 times over and then yeah that trip to the you know to Florida was wonderful but mom was doing you know <laughs> so that sort of thing um I'm not sure I really do balance it um I try so I take I take time out but even if I go on a vacation I sneak away and do my work <laughs> That's what I love. I do love it. Yeah, if, if you love it, then, you know, why stop? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It doesn't feel like work. It just feels like what I do. Exactly. Um, my dad and I always have this debate of how Americans only like care about their jobs and they don't really have hobbies outside of their jobs. But I'm like, it's because they love their jobs. Like so many people that I know love their jobs. They're not just doing it for money. Um, and so they're more incentivized to work all the time because that's what they love. Um, and I see the same thing with my mom. She is a workaholic as well. She just recruited the whole family into her job. So that's how she did her work. Like that. That's brilliant. Yeah. I might follow her lead there. That's a good one. 
oh, it was smart. She was like, you have to come to this event. You're going to learn more here than you will in a day of school. And I think she was ultimately correct. So. Yeah. Nice. Um, so I am approaching 21. Um, and obviously that is pretty young. I feel old, but that's pretty young. Is there any advice that you have for me approaching 21? Things that you wish you knew? Um, advice for me? who I'm not really sure of my career path. Yeah, I'd say be brave. Be brave. Um, don't let don't let fear stop you. Um, look at what the world needs and try to hook it up with what you're passionate about. So, you know, and I think that there are going to be career paths for your generation that don't exist at the moment. So just for an example, I think that in your generation and the next few generations, there's going to be a water shortage. And so water conservation, for example, I'm just giving you one example. There are programs now that you can learn about that sort of thing, certificate programs and so forth. But what happens in the next 10 years is going to be something different. So the thing to do is whatever your interests are, learn as much as you can about them but realize that those traditional career paths will probably always be there, but there are gonna be opportunities for you that don't exist right now. So I would say prepare yourself so that you're kind of um, ready to go with the flow when the time comes. Or I can always do what you did and just create your own, <laughs> your own career path. That's what I mean. I mean, you know, it, um, you've got to be ready. You've got to be prepared. You've got to have your background. You've got to know the field, but then you can make something new. That's amazing. That's really good advice and makes me feel a lot better going into the job world. Um, but that was my last question. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time to mentor myself and all the others who will listen to this interview. We were so happy to have you and to be able to highlight your accomplishments um, and your work at Narrative Strategies through this interview. So, so thank you so much, Dr. Moss. Thank you and good luck to you. <laughs>